Hi, Patrick here. Welcome to the second episode of the Matrix of Thought series where we discover, discuss, and demonstrate thought-provoking perspectives. Today, we are exploring outliers in our society. What do most of us associate with the likes of Bill Gates of Microsoft, Joe Flom of Skadden Arps, and the Beatles? Genius is likely one of them, born lucky, possibly another. Importantly though, the superficial story we get told about such individuals is that they have managed to climb up the ladder only through individual merit. By extension, however, it implies that those who do not work hard enough will simply not make it. The problem with this is that there are many people out there who put in the effort, yet they still don't make it. They are simply not lucky enough. The question is then, what do successful people, these so-called outliers, have that most people do not? Malcolm Gladwell explores this thought in Outliers. Of course, their path to success is in part due to their exceptional talent, but what truly distinguishes their histories is because of their extraordinary opportunities. Let's focus on Bill Gates' story. In 1968, the Mothers of Lakeside School in Seattle, a school he was able to attend because of his wealthy upbringing, took the $3,000 from the rummage sale and bought a computer for its computer club. To put this into perspective, most universities didn't even have personal computers. At the time, programming itself was extraordinarily tedious. Computer programs were created using cardboard punch cards, so each line of the code was imprinted on the card using a key punch machine. If you have a complex enough program, it could include hundreds or thousands of such cards. And computers could only handle one task at a time. You make an appointment with the operator for your program, and depending on how many people are in front of you, it may take a while until you even try out your program. To top off this nightmare, even if you made a single error, you would have to take the cards back and begin the entire process again from the back of the queue. Luckily though, the computer that the mothers bought was a time-sharing terminal. This was a computer that could handle multiple appointments at once, thus making the act of programming enjoyable, and more importantly, you could do it consistently. Given it was one of a handful of schools in the world to have access to this technology, it's sufficient to say that Bill Gates had a unique hands-on experience. He also lived within walking distance of the University of Washington, which happened to have free computer time between 3 and 6 in the morning. Software companies in Seattle were desperately looking for programmers to work with their technologies and thanks to the hours that Bill had racked up, he was able to size the opportunity immediately. So what do all of these opportunities have in common? They gave Bill extra time to practice his computing skills. By the time he dropped out of Harvard to start a software company, Microsoft, he essentially accumulated seven years of non-stop programming at a time when such a technology was at its infancy. Malcolm also pointed out that most software entrepreneurs, Bill Gates, Paul Allen, Steve Jobs, etc., were born within a tight window, 1954 to 1956. While this may seem like a coincidence, or possibly even insignificant at the first glance, it would turn out to be critical to their path to success. Consider this. If you were too old in 1975, you would likely take up a job at IBM straight out of university, and it would be difficult to leave this established, multi-billion dollar corporation while paying back your tuition and mortgage loan for an upcoming small software company like Microsoft. Conversely, if you were too young, you would also miss this train to some extent. Bill Gates was literally born at the right time. Of course, a given level of intelligence and the desire to work hard are both assumed to hold true, but what we are really interested in is what else do you need to become successful? By putting Bill Gates' timeline into context, we give birth to a much clearer picture of the path to success. With a plethora of examples, including how cultural legacies may explain why Asians are generally good in math, why the power of hierarchy may explain the many plane crashes of our career, and many more, by the end of Outlier, you realize that the lesson is rather simple. Success is not a simple linear function of individual merit, yet it is indeed absolutely a necessary variable. It begs the question, what could all the people with limited opportunities do if they were given greater opportunities? Having said all of the above, the only thing that you can truly control and improve upon is your work ethic. If we seek to extract a quality that outliers like Bill Gates have that everyday people can apply to their lives in the pursuit of success, we arrive at a common denominator shared amongst outliers, their relentless working. In fact, I would argue that even if you have the most favorable environment and timing, it won't amount to success without hard work.
Working hard to inch closer to your goal is one thing, but doing it consistently is another. In order to maintain your work ethic in the long term, you need to stay motivated. In a podcast with Yes Theory, a group of three individuals who have created a worldwide movement through their core philosophy of pushing themselves out of their comfort zone and growing as individual people, they said that whenever we challenge who we think we are, it is uncomfortable. Indeed, the idea of yearning for comfort is part of our biology, and for the right reasons. Low levels of anxiety, stress, and fear are, from an evolutionary perspective, likely associated with a habitat that is close to sources of food and far from predators, a circle of safety. It is therefore not surprising that swimming against this tide requires a constant stream of effort, energy, and motivation. Simon Sinek famously introduced the idea of the golden circle. It is categorized into three parts, why, how, and what. At its core, it challenges the status quo for identifying your purpose for what you want to do, whether in life or business. In other words, it explains why some leaders and corporations are able to inspire people and continuously evolve and innovate, while others fail. Biologically, the outer circle, the what, corresponds to the neocortex of our brain. It is responsible for the rational, analytical, and language part of the brain. The inner two circles, the how and why, correspond to the limbic brain. It is responsible for emotions, behavior, and decision-making. When we work from the inside of the circle to the outside, we communicate directly with a part of the brain that controls behavior, subsequently allowing us to rationalize those decisions. Why is the golden circle relevant in the context of understanding outliers and applying their mindset to ours? If you find your why, your fundamental belief, you are developing a mindset that will propel your progress forwards. I believe it is one component in your life that you have complete control over and possibly may be the only one component you need to achieve success by your own definition. Hard work is the necessary but not sufficient condition for success. That is why we only have a few outliers out of the masses. It is a misconception that putting in the effort is all you need and I think this is not stressed enough in big success motivational stories which could make one disillusioned and question what he or she is doing. That said, I argue that even the most favorable environment and timing would amount to little without hard work. In the grand equation of success, this is the only thing we can control and improve upon. Thank you for exploring the matrix of thoughts with me. I hope this video tickles your curiosity and see you in the next one.